Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to conservation and careful management of the state's forests to make them more resilient and better habitats for wildlife. Choosewood.com. St. Louis Public Radio's The Gateway gives you the day's news first thing every weekday morning. From the ever-evolving relationship between St. Louis City and County to developments in the Missouri and Illinois state capitals and reports from our correspondents in Rolla and the Metro East, we put it all in a roughly 10-minute package with clarity and context. Download The Gateway wherever you get podcasts. So you think it all comes down to the jury selection, that these were jurors who were inclined to be pro-cop and therefore felt it was okay for cops to beat an undercover cop? I don't know. As I said, I can't get into their minds. But when you have people confess in writing to multiple people Mm -hmm. and then the jury kind of bends over backwards and takes about a day to decide that they can't figure that out. One skill for an attorney always is picking a jury. I'm Sarah Fenske. This is St. Louis on the Air. Yesterday, the U.S. Attorney's Office announced that it would retry two St. Louis police officers charged with beating an undercover colleague. The two were on trial in federal court last month, along with a third officer. That third officer, Stephen Cordy, was found not guilty. But the jury deadlocked on some charges against former officers Dustin Boone and Christopher Myers. And that left the decision of whether to try them again in the hands of prosecutors. Their new trial is now set for June 7th. And joining us today to talk about what that means is attorney Javad Kazali. He's a former federal prosecutor, and he watched this trial with particular interest. He's filed 13 different lawsuits related to police conduct on that same night that officers Boone and Myers allegedly beat up their undercover colleague. That includes a class action lawsuit with more than 100 people suing. And Javad Kazali joins us today to talk about what this decision means for those cases and much more. So Javad, welcome back. Thanks for having me, sir. So, Javad, you've been following this case so closely. What do you make of the prosecutor's decision to retry uh, former officers Boone and Myers? It's not surprising. Um, hmm. You know, these are the two officers who, through their statements to other police officers and through text messages that the FBI was able to obtain, admitted to being a part of the beatdown. Um, they even used language saying that they were a part of it, um, that they were actively involved in this. In fact, I was actually pretty shocked, having sat in on probably 80% of the trial, that the jury did not convict these two officers the first time through. I was going to say, this sounds like some really good evidence. After having sat through most of this, what went wrong the first time? You know, you can only do so much once the jury is is chosen as has been reported, originally this jury was 100% white. Um, Virtually all of the jury was from southern portions of Missouri. Hmm. If you have a jury that walks in that already has preconceived notions about whether they're willing to hold police accountable, I don't know what was going on in the jury's mind. I did see, read one interview with one of the jurors where he said that there wasn't enough physical evidence. And... That seemed very strange to me because there were multiple officers who testified to seeing these people being a part of the beatdown. And then you had their own words and texts saying, I did this. I mean, Officer Boone texted repeatedly with his father, who's a former police officer, saying, I was a part of this. I'm not, um, I'm embarrassed that I was a part of this. Um, and still, apparently, his own confession wasn't enough. Hmm. So you think it all comes down to the jury selection, that these were jurors who were inclined to be pro-cop and therefore felt it was okay for cops to beat an undercover cop? I don't know. As I said, I can't get into their minds. But when you have people confess in writing to multiple people Mm -hmm. and then the jury kind of bends over backwards and takes about a day to decide that they can't figure that out. I mean, with Myers, remember, he's only being tried for, retried for breaking Officer Hall's phone. 
He was found he, not guilty on, on the main charge, that deprivation of rights charge. Correct. And during the trial, a former St. Louis police officer who is now an FBI agent testified that he saw Myers on top of Officer Hall beating him. Another St. Louis police officer testified that Officer Myers walked up to him and said, I was a part of the beating and I hit um, Officer Hall multiple times, but I wasn't the one who effed him up. Hmm. I'm good for his phone. But remember, they were charged with aiding and embedding the deprivation of civil rights. So if he's beating somebody while somebody else is beating that person, that should have been enough for a conviction in my mind. But the jury thought about that differently. So Scott Rosenblum, pretty much the most prominent uh, criminal defense attorney in town, he was representing Christopher Myers. How much of this verdict do you think comes down to the fact that he's really good at sowing seeds of doubt? Um, you know, Scott's an amazing attorney. Um, I think he was dealt a bad hand um, at this case because of the facts. And I think that they tried to make this case seem more of a conspiracy, um, but they never had a really good answer for why his client had admitted to this multiple times. Mm -hmm. so, that seems like know, a I really think, bad piece of evidence right there for them, but he, but, but he remember, was able to work with it. But remember, one skill for an attorney always is picking a jury. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. So now they're going to get their chance again with a different jury. This is going to be coming up in June. Again, as you say, uh, Christopher Myers won't see that charge again of deprivation of rights, just of destruction of evidence for destroying this phone. Um, but Dustin Boone is going to face that more serious charge, the deprivation of rights charge. Do you think we would see the decision to bring this case again to trial if the Trump administration were still in charge of the U.S. Attorney's Office? Probably. I mean, the this U.S. Attorney's Office was willing to take this case forward during the Trump administration. Now, I think they deserve credit for that. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we have provided them with, you know, one of the defenses in this case was, well, yes, somebody beat up Luther Hall, but you don't know exactly who did that. We then were able to present them with tons of evidence that two hours later, the same large group of police officers beat dozens upon dozens of citizens. And we have tons of video where we have definitively identified many of the officers who are doing this. You can see name tags. The officers in depositions have admitted it's them. And this U.S. Attorney's Office wasn't willing to charge any police officers for that case. In the back of my mind, and I think it's a fair question is, why is the U.S. Attorney's Office willing to go through all of these steps when a police officer is injured, but when it's a citizen, there's a, apparently a whole different set of rules as to whether or not police should be charged for beating citizens. And you're saying the evidence is even more clear cut in these cases involving citizens. Why is that, that, that you've got actually a stronger case potentially, evidence-wise, um, than against this undercover officer? In the Hall case, there was one really weird, um, bad coincidence. A photojournalist from the St. Louis American was on the scene, and he started taking pictures. And the pictures show the police come up to Officer Hall and begin to put hands on him. And then right when the beatdown happened, a police vehicle drove right past them and parked in between the officers and the photographer. Mm -hmm. And then when the vehicle pulled away, there's photos of the aftermath of a bloody Luther Hall. In our case, there were hundreds of people videotaping as everything happened. A federal judge has looked at videos in our cases. There's actually a video that takes covers 45 minutes leading up to the kettle and beat down. And a federal judge, Judge Perry, the same judge that is the judge in the first Luther Hall case, determined that there's no evidence that anybody was doing anything against the law. Hmm. And there's a difference when you have hundreds of people with their cell phones and cameras and security cameras that we've got tons of video and we've been able to, for most of the officers, identify them. I mean, in the Hall case, the officer Boone sent a text that said, we can't wait to go out, and I'm paraphrasing this, to beat people 
in the middle of the night when we're all dressed alike and it's impossible for them to tell the difference. I mean, they plan to do this ahead of time. And this police vehicle that blocked the view of Officer Hall as he was undercover being v- beaten, um, this was pure coincidence that this just pulled up? This is not part of the conspiracy? Yeah, I think so. When you look at the video, it just looks like it's driving down the street and just randomly stops. Okay. So you have some really good evidence in these civil cases that you're bringing. Does the fate of this criminal case have any impact on um, your attempt to find justice through the civil courts for your clients? I think, you know, although this wasn't justice for Luther Hall, a lot of great things came out in this um, case for our clients. Multiple officers admitted that the reason they didn't remember anything happening to Luther Hall was that many people were getting beaten all weekend, (laughs) that this was typical, that this didn't stand out to them, that this would not have been a big deal if it wasn't an undercover police officer, even to the point of saying that that morning there was a rah-rah speech from their supervisors where their supervisors basically told them that they were loosening their rules of engagement. And the next day, after they beat all of these people, including Luther Hall, one of the officers described the next day's meeting as jubilant, like it was a high school homecoming. Mm -hmm. And this just goes into a long history of this police department just doing ridiculous things that are utterly embarrassing that any one of which would be a scandal at any other police department in America. So let's talk a little bit about that. The St. Louis Police Department has said they have some bad apples and when bad apples come up, they deal with them. Do you think that's fair to say about this department? Yeah, um, I think that the bad apples part is, um, I wasn't born in America. I came to America when I was two, and idioms are very hard for people who learn um, the English language. But nobody ever talks about the second part of that idiom. Bad apples spoil the bunch, and that's what's been happening here. I mean, look, in June, just let's look at the last four years. June 2017, Milton Green, one of our clients, a black undercover police officer, is shot by a white police officer. He's not disciplined. The Stockley verdict, Luther Hall is beaten. None of those officers are disciplined until the FBI investigates them later. Today, there's a trial for William Olston, who was fired, and he's being charged for um, pepper spraying multiple people. And he was also charged previously for lying about a fight where he shot a guy in a bar. In January of 2019, Caitlin Alex, a St. Louis police officer, is killed when she goes to the house of a police officer. Those two police officers um, that are at the house are on duty, they are drinking, and Alex is killed in what they claim to be a Russian roulette incident. That summer, the Plainview Project does a, a report on the St. Louis Police Department. 43 current and former officers are found to have 400 racist posts. I believe of those 43, only two were disciplined. February of this year, a St. Louis police officer is charged for forging a COVID note that was covered all across America. And just last month, two St. Louis police officers were charged with raping people. That's all happened in the last four years. Any one of these would be the type of scandal at another police department that would cause leadership to to be replaced. Javon, this, this is just to us. Yeah, go ahead. This is just business as usual here with this police department. That's such a sobering list of cases. And as you know, um, today is the mayor's election. We are going to get a new mayor in charge of this city. Um, what do you think needs to happen here after this, this four years of, of just really dark history? I have been very happy with um, one of the candidates, um, Tashara Jones, has come straight out and said that the people involved in the white police union, um, especially Jeff Rorta, who has been flaming these types of things, that she will not engage with him. Um, And that she had stated before that she would fire the public safety director. He's actually since resigned. Um, And that she would look very strongly at considering whether or not we need to replace the police chief. Um, The fact that somebody's willing to say that is pretty important to being able to move the city forward. Remember, our police department gets almost 50% of all of the funding um, that is spent by our St. Louis city government. 
<laughs> That's a, a big expenditure right there. And as you say, there have been some real problems in the past year. I want to bring this back to Luther Hall here in our final couple minutes here. You mentioned that for a number of the police officers who testified, this didn't even stand out to them. There were so many different beatings that had happened on this night and in the couple of, of days uh, around this weekend where this happened. Are you aware of anyone else uh, who was out there as a protester or an undercover officer posing as a protester who was injured as badly as Luther Hall was injured? No, I mean, Luther Hall's injuries are pretty devastating. He had two um, spinal discs replaced. He had surgery through his neck where a metal plate was put into his neck with six screws. But we also have people who did receive beatings and have both physical and mental um, damages to this day. I mean, one of the officers, a Sergeant Marcantano, testified that while Luther Hall was being beat up, he was beating up another person next to him. And, quote, I think what he said was, I wasn't doing much. I was just hitting him a few times with my baton. Because they don't think that's a big deal. And so these cases that you're pursuing, uh, you intend to use some of this testimony against them. Um, do you think any of these cases will go to trial, or do you think the city is now going to be ready to settle these left and right? Well, the Cruzan administration has done everything in its power to pass the buck. They did not want to engage in anything serious to get rid of these. We are hopeful that if either of these two candidates are elected, that they will decide to look at these cases through the same lens. I mean, remember, Luther Hall settled for $5 million. We're representing 120 other people who were beaten a few hours later. The idea that of the hundreds of people who were arrested that night by the same large group, that randomly the only person who was illegally arrested was one random black undercover cop is laughable. You would hope that they would come and settle these, but if they don't, we filed under the Civil Rights Act, so not only if we win will we get money, but we can charge the city our attorney's fees, which will be very, very, very large. Well, Javad Ghazali of the firm Ghazali Warsh, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your insight. Thanks for having me again. And we want to remind people this is former officer Dustin Boone and former officer Christopher Myers. They will now face again a jury over these charges. Uh, that is now scheduled to happen on June 7th. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio, 90.7 KWMU. If you learned something new from today's episode, consider leaving us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the easiest way to help people discover our show. We appreciate it. Thank you. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to conservation and careful management of the state's forests to make them more resilient and better habitats for wildlife. Choosewood.com.